and it was a lot cooler than it is right now, I preached on a longer passage from Matthew 5. Matthew 5 is part of the Sermon on the Mount. And at the time, I didn't dive into the part on divorce. And I got some requests to say, yeah, could you actually dig into that a little bit more? So here we are. I will be honest, I was kind of dreading the deeper dive. But actually, having done it, I learned a lot. And I'm really glad I did it. Before I get into the reflection on the, on the text, and before I have these guys read the text, I want to remind you guys what was in my mind before I wrote my reflection. I don't know who's been divorced. I don't know who's contemplating divorce. I don't know who's ruled out divorce as an option. The one thing I do know from my gig as a pastor is that you cannot know what happens inside a marriage. So let me assure you that if you think you know who I'm talking about during the sermon today, you don't, because I don't. Um, I was going to caution you guys that when we have kids in worship, we need to be handled adult subjects carefully. I think we are fine, but I just want to explain that my definition for this church service of, a, of adultery is doing adult things. I figured that would allow the parents to get home without weird questions in the car from the pre-kindergartners. Pre now, as I try to do every week, I did my best to figure out what the scripture meant when it was written, and what it means now, and what it reveals about God both then and now. And hopefully I'll make it clear where I get my arguments from, but as always, feel free to ask for clarification. In the end, it's not my understanding that matters, it's yours. And finally, this week, more than any other, I am very aware of being a single, never married, not a mom, woman, who is the product of parents who have been married for 59 years so far. But then again, I don't know what it means to be a subsistence farmer in Palestine 2,000 years ago, and that comes up all the time. So, with that frame, first can I ask Peter, can I ask you to read the passage from Matthew 5? Thank you. 
even if the way we make space for them is completely different. So in the kingdom of God, all marriages will be gifts from God and last until death. And if our marriages don't do that, you know, maybe they started as gifts from God, or maybe they were something else from the very beginning. Does that mean we can never enter the kingdom of God? In our world today, there are going to be those who hunger and thirst for righteousness. And as far as I can tell, their life is not going to be full of peace. So do they not get in while the peacemakers do? I don't think that's what Jesus is saying. In the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus says that if your right eye causes you to sin, you should tear it out. No one thinks we should take that literally. He is saying we should be aware of what the ideal is and do our best to keep it. But I don't think compliance with the ideal is expected or required. That's what it means that the kingdom is already, but not yet. So Jesus is describing an ideal as well as a community that has many different kinds of people in it in order to be the kingdom of God. I need to go on to Matthew 19 to make the next point, but I want to make sure we're still we're good with Matthew 5 for the moment in the Sermon on the Mount. Questions so far? be plenty of, we can go back, there's going to be plenty. All right, Matthew 19, part of the candy book. Now, had to read the first little bit where it said he had just left Galilee, All right, and is now in Judea. He's in the territory that is governed by Herod Antiochus, who's the son of Herod the Great, who we met in the Christmas story, right? All right, Herod Antiochus divorced his wife in order to marry Herodias. And John the Baptist called him out on that. And Herod and Antiochus did not like being called out. So when Herodias' daughter Salome asked for the head of John the Baptist on the platter, Herod delivered. If you were a Pharisee, who wanted to get Jesus out of your way, would you not ask what Jesus' position on divorce was? And even if, even if that wasn't what the Pharisees were doing, and, and maybe that wasn't what they were doing, there was a huge debate raging at the time in the Jewish community. One side said divorce was allowed only in cases of adultery. That was the Shemai side. The other side, the Hillel side, said, no, divorce was allowed in just about any case. So you can imagine, knowing human beings, then and now, which side was more popular. So if you were a Pharisee and you wanted to reduce the number of followers that Jesus had, and you suspected he was not on the Hillel side, the divorce for any reason side, wouldn't you try to get him on the record? Now, Jesus doesn't take the bait. Jesus tells the Pharisees to go back to first principles. He said, remember where marriages came from. In the beginning, God created us so that we might not be lonely. We are joined together to become one flesh. And the word for flesh in Genesis can also mean personality. So it's more than just our bodies. It's, it's that who we are, that thing that has changed for um, Mike in his accident. There is a sense that marriage completes us, that it doesn't diminish us, not just physically, but in our personalities, in our identities. And then the Pharisees argue that if that's the principle, that's the ideal, why did Moses command us to give a certificate of divorce? And Jesus is like, guys, Moses gave us the Ten Commandments. Divorce wasn't one of them. 
humans can't always hold up the ideal, maybe because they're hard-hearted, maybe because their personalities have changed. That's when divorce comes into play. It's not a law. So in a completely different set of circumstances, Jesus describes marriage until death as a principle or an ideal. Now I am going to handle the second part of the reading from Matthew in a second, but I want to make sure we're good with the first part. So we're, we're good? Questions, comments, thoughts, eye rolls? Okay. Now, this is the part that I think is the hardest for us to wrap our heads around. I want to take a moment to describe what divorce was like in the Jewish community at the time. And I want to say, you have to be kind of careful because Christian scholars like to draw on Jewish writings from all different periods and say that was what it was like during Jesus' lifetime. And that's not, you know, the Jewish community is evolving just like the Christian community is evolving. But at that time in Israel, pretty much everyone married. And pretty much everyone was supposed to have kids. Maybe, maybe, if you were a man and wanted to dedicate yourself to studying the Bible, maybe you didn't have to marry. But even then, you were kind of expected to marry. Everyone was expected to marry and to have kids. And people who couldn't have kids were outcasts. There were specific rules about where they could go, physically go. And of course, not being able to have kids was a valid reason for divorce. Now, marriages were mostly arranged by parents or matchmakers, sometimes when the children were very young. Now, the women could say no once they turned 12. I don't know. For me to say no to my parents when I was 12 would take a lot. Remember, too, and this is the part that's just really hard to wrap your head around, a woman was property. She was either the property of her father or of her husband. And if both of those had died, she was the property of her son. When she was married, she came with a dowry. And if she was divorced, she got her dowry back. But economics being what they are, she would probably need to be to marry again in order to, to keep even, in order to keep body and soul together. Women could not divorce their husbands. The husband was the only one who could file for divorce. Women could go to the courts, which is really like going to the local school board or something. It's, it's your local community. It's the people who know you and your husband and your father or whatever. And he could, they could ask, the women could ask, that the courts put pressure on the husband to divorce her. Now, she had more of a justification for asking for a divorce if somehow he had developed some social disease like leprosy that kept you on the outside of the community. Or if he was forcing her to leave Israel, that was another reason she could go to the court. But in the end, it was the husband who had to ask for divorce. Now, adultery was assumed to be a basis for divorce. If, in fact, if it happened, the marriage was assumed to be over. But to be clear, let's say husband A is married to wife A, and husband B is married to wife B, and husband A and wife B do adult things together. It's only marriage B that is considered Women were property. And if you committed adultery with a married woman, you were stealing property from her husband. It was theft. I know. I know. Like, how do humans make this work? Right? So into this world, Jesus says you shouldn't have divorce except for unchastity. 
he was sort of stating everyone's understanding of what was going on. Mark and Luke don't include that exception for unchastity. There's also some academic technical ambiguity about the word translated, what that is translated as unchastity, what it meant, how broad the definitions were at the time. But to me, the nuances they were fighting over, the academics are fighting over, paled in comparison to this definition of adultery. Only married women, slaves, prostitutes, courtesans didn't count. And into this world, Jesus says that men can commit adultery by doing something seemingly as innocent as sleeping with their second wife. Jesus says that men are not led astray by women, but by following their own desires into adultery. This is radical. In a society where women are property, Jesus' stance here is pretty amazing. Okay, I know, it's crazy. Questions? Because how can this work? How can this possibly work? And yet it did. So imagine what it is like to follow Jesus. An unmarried man without children in a society where marriage and children are the goal of every single person. And he was saying that this could be a calling from God. Jesus' disciples had heard what he was saying, that marriage was a gift from God and you better not throw it away. And they looked around and they weren't convinced they could risk staying married for their whole lives. And Jesus tells them, hey, there's another kind of gift from God, of being single and without children. And he says that, and the next thing that happens is that parents bring their kids to be blessed, and the disciples shoo them away, and Jesus says, no, for it is to such as these that the kingdom of God belongs. The kingdom of God is already and not yet. It is the ideal, and the ideal has not yet come. And when the ideal arrives, there will be married people and single people. There will be people with children and people without. There will be all sorts of people, peacemakers and merciful and meek. There will be kids without money and eager to learn and able to see things the way they really are and wonder why they're that way. And all those people, all of us, we will be part of that community and we will need to take care of each other, especially the children. None of us can be ideal in all things, but all of us being together, bringing the gifts we bring, that will be the ideal. Because that will be the kingdom of God, the kingdom that is already and not yet. So as I read these texts and learned more about the context in which Jesus makes his statements, I do think he is lying, laying out principles to guide us. Marriage should be until death. It should be a gift from God. It should be a way to help us grow more fully into what God created us to be. We should go into marriage with that goal. We should commit to the hard and unending work to allow that to continue to happen. But in this world, where the kingdom of God is already but also not yet, even doing our best, some marriages are not going to last until death. They should not last until death. Because marriage until death is not only the ideal, and it is not the only ideal. 
There is an ideal of being single. There is an ideal of being childless. There is an ideal of meeting a whole bunch of different kinds of people to make a whole community. And I think that that means that in the kingdom of God, especially while we're in the not yet phase, we need divorced people. We need women who are not anyone's property. We need children who are not ours, but we care for. We need to bring the gifts that God has given us. And yes, sometimes those gifts are not the ones we ask for. And they are not the ones we would wish on anyone. But they are the gifts that God has given us on the path to becoming who we are called to be. And that's the ideal that allows us to reconcile, recognize that while the kingdom of God is not yet, it is indeed already here. Amen.